you know what, you're right. Okay. All right, so um, good evening. My name is Alexis Morris, um, and I will be your moderator for tonight. Uh, our panel is called The First Wavering Step of People Toward Organized Social Life, a discussion on mutual aid societies in Petersburg and Richmond. Uh, this uh, panel tonight is both in person and also is being streamed. Uh, it is being streamed and recorded. Um, and we will also give an opportunity tonight for those who are on uh, the YouTube live stream to answer some questions during the question and answer portion. Tonight's panel is a partnership between the Historic Petersburg Foundation and Resist Booksellers. The Historic Petersburg Foundation's mission is to lead in the preservation and restora restoration of Petersburg's historic architecture and neighborhoods and to tell the story. The goals, objectives, and initiatives of the corporation are to acquire, hold, improve, preserve, develop, and restore sites, buildings, residences, and squares. This is my second time hosting an event here at Resist Booksellers. Like the last event, tonight's presentation epitomizes the resistance of Black people against systems of oppression and the creativity that is born from the practice of resistance. W.E.B. Du Bois, in his book, The Negro Church, would praise the Free African Society, which was created in Philadelphia as the first wavering step toward organized social life for Black citizens of the city. He emphasized the cultural, political, and economic benefits of mutual aid and benevolent societies as tools to successfully navigate racial discrimination and foster positive Black identity. These societies embodied the principles of cooperative economics, which were enterprises that were a combination of member-owned, member-run, and or member-served that focused on satisfying a need than maximizing a profit. Black participation is, um, in mutual aid represents the, need, the development of communities of care that reject capitalist ideas of scarcity and instead focus on how to create abundance. Tonight, we will begin with a presentation on the origin of Black mutual aid societies in the United States to provide a background for those unfamiliar with the topic. Before or after that, our panelists will provide more site-specific stories of mutual aid and benevolent societies here in Petersburg and Richmond. After that, we'll go into facilitated questions. That will then be followed by question and answer period. Um, as I stated earlier, those of you who are on live stream will be able to uh, put questions into the chat for our panelists here to answer. In addition to that, I do want to point out uh, that we do have some books here uh, that will provide additional uh, information if you're interested in this topic. Uh, those books are going to be The Negro and the American Revolution by Benjamin Quarles, uh, The Colored Convention Movement um, by P. Gabrielle Foreman, My Face is Black is True, Callie House and the Struggle for Ex Slave Reparations by Mary Frances Berry. Um, additionally, tonight we will also offer the opportunity uh, 
for those of you who either have copies of Elva's book, um, the American series, Richmond, Virginia, to be signed, uh, or for you to purchase that as well here. So there are copies of that book. In addition to that, I'd like to also state that after the panel is over, we'll allow about an hour or so for folks to mingle, ask additional questions to our panelists, and look around the store. Um, so please take an opportunity to do that. With that being said, I'd like to take an opportunity tonight to introduce our two panelists. Um, unfortunately, our third panelist, Ben Anderson, was unable to make it tonight due to illness, uh, but we are lucky to have two panelists still here with us uh, who can still share that information. First, I'll start with Elva Parker Belshes. She is an award-winning public historian, researcher, presenter, and guest curator. She is the author of the publication Black America series, Richmond, Virginia, um, and has eight biographical entries for the African American National Biography. Belshus was commissioned by the National Park Service to research, author, and narrate the historic Jackson Ward podcast tour in 2009. She is a double alumna and former faculty member of Hampton University and a graduate of the MCV slash VCU School of Pharmacy. She has conducted further study in the Graduate Certificate Program in Public History at the University of Richmond. She has several documentaries in development and was honored to serve as the in-studio researcher on the Steven Spielberg's motion picture, Lincoln. We also have with us today, Courtney Morris. She is a seasoned professional in the realms of public media and public history, having made significant con contributions to both since 2014. She is a proud graduate of Howard University, holding a Bachelor of Arts degree in French and political science. Committed to furthering her expertise in the field, she is currently pursuing a certificate certification in public history and historical preservation. She has created extensive historical and social media content across platforms showcasing her commitment to public education and community engagement. As an advocate for African American history, Courtney has been invited to share her insights and thoughts on podcasts where she delved into the intricacies and, <clears throat> and underrepresented aspects of Black American history. Uh, now that I've gone into our introductions of our two wonderful panelists tonight, I would like to uh, get into our, uh, our presentation. For those of you who are in the audience, you will not see the PowerPoint. For those of you who are on live stream, you will see a PowerPoint to accompany um, Courtney's presentation. Um, and with that said, Courtney, let's go. Hi, thank you for coming. So my name is Courtney Morris and this evening I will provide you with some general background on the development of black mutual aid societies in the United States. So the US has a very long history of um, coming together, creating grassroots organizations for the purposes of providing resources to our community. The earliest organizations were created to help freedmen integrate into society as large, as well as alleviate social and economic stressors. So they started developing in the late 1700s and continue into present day. They are the building box for our black churches, our schools and HBCUs, our banks, our insurance companies, as well as small businesses. And they would also provide the framework for collective black political action, as well as the modern day civil rights movement. So some may be curious why there was a need to integrate a surplus of black freedmen into society in the late 1700s. This need actually arose from um, America's very first sizable emancipation of black folks, which would be the American Revolution, right? Black men joined the war at the very beginning on both sides, British and American, under the assumption that they would be freed upon serving. Some veterans opted to leave the country. However, some chose simply to leave the South 
and migrated to urban centers in New England. So towards the end of the American Revolution, we see a few things happening, right? We have this influx of free uh, black men coming into urban centers in New England. And what we see starting to pop up are these white uh, founded charitable organizations. So I want to briefly discuss a few of the popular ones that came up in this era. So the very first one I want to discuss is the New York Manumission Society. Uh, it was founded by white, politically well-connected elites in 1785. They sought to deal with this upsurge of black residents in the city, New York City. Uh, they were campaigning for the abolition of slavery in the state of New York, as well as offering legal protections to freedmen from traffickers. Their all-white governing body was hypervigilant, seeking, according to their minute meetings, their meeting minutes to quote, keep a watchful eye over the conduct of such Negroes as have been or may be liberated and to prevent them from running into immorality or sinking into idleness. Now I went through some of the minutes. Uh, I didn't see what folks were doing, but that was one of their major concerns. So in 1788, they formed a special committee for the sole purpose of influencing freedmen to improve their behaviors, which they didn't bother to put down in the meeting minutes. The society sternly advised black free New Yorkers to not commingle with the enslaved or servant populations of the city. They also advised them not to patronize their businesses. Black freedmen were even told to refrain from playing music, engaging in loud types of entertainment or dancing. And for a moment, this society even contemplated establishing a registry of free black men residing in the city explicitly for the purposes of tracking their behavior. So the registry doesn't appear to have come to fruition, but despite that, the society continued to oversee the black community's conduct and threatened to withhold legal and monetary assistance if they did anything that they did not approve of or like. The next foundation or association that I'd like to go over is the American Colonization Society, which going forward, I will simply call the ACS. So that was founded in 1816 for the explicit purpose of simply deporting black freedmen. This was deemed the perfect solution for those who did not like the institution of slavery, but still had anti-black prejudices and could not see black people as socially equal to them even upon being freed. The ACS was not concerned with enslaved children, enslaved black men, nor enslaved black women, but they were troubled with the increasing amount of free black people moving about the country. They feared that this presence of free black people mingling with enslaved black folks might encourage a mutiny or stoke aspirations of freedom, thus disrupting America's social and racial hierarchy that was being built at the time. They also believed that by deporting free black folks, they could Christianize Western Africa, they could curb the growth of the black population in the United States, and they could also give black Americans the chance or to demonstrate their capacity for self-governance. And they were also under the impression that a reduction in free black people in the United States would uh, uh, stabilize the price of enslaved laborers in the US. So at the top of the presentation, I mentioned that mutual aid societies provided the framework for collective black political action as well as a civil rights movement, right? So our earliest organizations tended to be hyper-localized, but around 1830, it became really clear that philanthropy and grassroots organizing would not solve all the issues plaguing the black community and that some disparities existed on a state level as well as a national level, and that they actually required policy in order to affect permanent changes and broader changes. And so thus the colored conventions movement was born. 
So the colored conventions movement refers to a decades long period when black men and women attended conventions for the purposes of developing political action plans, establishing larger community building projects, protesting against state violence, as well as working on civil rights legislation for black Americans. Black Americans hosted both national and state conventions, which would end up becoming a place where we could develop and refine political thought as well as practices. So the very first documented convention occurred in September of 1830 in Philadelphia at the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. This 1830 convention was organized in reaction to new exclusionary laws that were passed in Ohio, um, as well as uh, rampant racial violence that was occurring across the country. So for this particular convention, topics covered were uh, the promotion of temperance, uh, discussing access to education, and they even organized a tribute to black soldiers fighting in the Union Army. The Colored Conventions Movement was the predecessor to the NAACP. It would be the predecessor to the Niagara Movement, uh, as well as the Colored National Labor Union and all other organizations that were created to push for full civil rights for Black Americans. So now we're gonna quickly review two of the earliest Black mutual aid societies created in the United States. Because these organizations were Black founded and Black led, they were actually able and more inclined, I would say, to tailor their services to the specific needs of the communities that they served. The first would be the African Union Society. This was founded in Newport, Rhode Island in 1780. It is the earliest society that we know of to date. This organization was notable for not only assisting black members of the association, but for also extending that assistance to black members, to black non-members in the city of Newport. They were integral in recording births and deaths, as well as the safekeeping of marriage records. They also acted as a de facto employment agency, pairing young Black apprentices with employers. So the second one would be the Free African Society, which Alexis mentioned a little bit earlier, that developed in Philadelphia in 1787. It was founded by two Black ministers, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen. The men actually created this organization to fill spiritual and religious disparity in the black community at the time. The Free African Society had several issues that it championed within the black community. They were concerned with the legitimization of marriages, the leasing of burial plots for members, the issuances of marriage licenses, and recording and safekeeping of birth records for black residents. So these organizations gained popularity swiftly and several would be created throughout the Eastern seaboard of the United States within a handful of years. They became so prevalent, particularly in the Northeast, that the first annual report of the American Moral Reform Society, which was established in 1837 by black men, cited benevolent societies as the most popular type of volunteer organization among black Americans in the five New England states that they polled. A majority of these mutual aid organizations were headquartered in cities as the majority of the free black population lived in urban areas. The groups were especially popular in Baltimore, Maryland with over 40 existing by 1840. In the Philadelphia Negro written by W.E.B. Du Bois, he would approximate that 76 of the city's 106 benevolent societies had raked in $16,814.23, and that is in the year 1848 alone. Membership in the earliest organizations consists of free and enslaved people. While many were certainly free upon joining, the organizations did not make being free a requirement in order to join allowing formerly enslaved people like Frederick Douglass to join and fully participate. 
And considering half of enslaved men and women who landed in America did so between the years of 1760 and 1810, many of the members of these many of the members of these societies had been born in Africa or just one to two generations removed from the continent. Some organizations required applicants to actually submit references for review prior to admission in the organization. One society actually required three references in order to sponsor one's entry into the organization per its bylaws written in 1796. And while membership in these societies could be often overwhelmingly male, it was quite common to see women in education-based societies as well as societies focused on public welfare. And by public welfare, I mean establishing nurseries, orphanages, hospitals, almshouses, that kind of a thing. Petersburg, Virginia should know this very well as half of its mutual aid societies were exclusively female. A few examples would be the Sisters of Friendship, the Sisters of Charity, which was developed in 1884, and the Ladies Union developed in 1896. In fact, by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, Petersburg, Virginia had 22 unique mutual aid organizations operating. One organization that was headquartered and operating in Petersburg at the time was actually the Workers' Mutual Aid Association, established in 1894. Within four years of establishing itself, it had 12 stockholders, two salaried employees, uh, 10,053 members, as well as an annual income of over $3,000. So this completes my very brief um, presentation. I will now hand it over to our moderator so she can start the, I guess, the question and answer part. Thank you, Courtney. Um, that was great, and it provides a lot of, uh, hopefully, information for you all for the information that's coming up um, between the two panelists and the questions. Um, I'd like to actually start with Courtney um, after she just kind of brought up that history of all of the mutual aid societies that were here in Petersburg, um, and starting with the uh, obituary of uh, Minerva Spratley in 1897. She was a citizen of Petersburg, um, and it is stated in her obituary that her funeral will be well attended on the account that she was a member of several benevolent societies. Um, so, Courtney and Elva, what do you think encouraged local community members like Minerva to become members, and how did mutual aid societies promote their services to citizens like Minerva? I'll start things off. Um, a lot of those benevolent societies were parts of the institution of what we call the black church. And so when you look at that period and well beyond that, the black church was the center of the black universe. And by that, I mean this, when it comes to um, developing your moral compasses, I mean, there were very few, you were probably looked down upon if you weren't a part of the body. Uh, it actually served, they actually served as educational institutions actually. Uh, Quick examples include uh, the first Baptist meeting house in Richmond, which was founded in 1780 as an integrated church. Uh, and around 1815 or so, when they decided they wanted to send missionaries out, uh, the Crane brothers, and it happened to be white, actually held night classes for black men three days a week. And so that, you know, because if they were going to go to Liberia, they needed to be educated. And so you can see the black church also as an educational institution also. With that, you had um, myriad secret societies that were founded prior to the end of the Civil War. And how do we know that? We know that because at the end of the Civil War, when the Freedmen's Bank was formed, you see lots of accounts with these really colorful names, the sons and daughters of Ham. Um, you, I mean, you name it, it's just myriad names of organizations. So those benevolent organizations had been active for decades within the black church. So that was nothing new, but again, uh, as a part of the body, you were probably looked 
or frowned upon if you weren't a part of the body, because that was an institution that allowed a profound sense of collectivism between people who were newly freed, people who had been free all of their lives and everyone in between. So I hope that answers that. Okay. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, Courtney, did you have anything to add? What was the last part of the question? Wasn't it what uh, encouraged them? Yes. Uh, so it's, and what encouraged the local or local community members like Minerva to become members? And how did mutual aid societies promote their services? So um, Elva Teresa already went over the church, so I won't do that. One way that we see that they're promoting their services is through printing of literature. So Callie House had her own mutual aid society, which also advocated for reparations. And she would create literature that would be sent out via the postal service. But you also see that um, quite a few, at least black leaders who are in these organizations, not only were they in several organizations, but they were at the head of newspapers. So one I can think of would be Martin Delaney, who I think is our first field officer in the army. He was in several organizations in Pittsburgh, several benevolent societies in Pittsburgh alone. But at a certain point before he left and started helping Frederick Douglass with the North Star, he had his own paper called The Mystery. You would see Susie Revels Caton. She was initially, I want to say in Alabama. Was she not? Where's Russ College? Don't hold me on it. She was over in the South, but she and her husband, Horace Caton, would end up going over to Washington State, and she would, she would found a Dorcas Charitable Society in Seattle, Washington. Her and her husband actually had um, a couple of newspapers that they, uh, they founded in Seattle as well. So the answer to one of the ways how they got the word out from these organizations, it would be by using all of the black press that was proliferating throughout the 1800s. May, may I add, yes, excuse please. Me, add to that with the black press, if we take a look at Richmond, uh, the very one of the very first or earliest black newspapers was the Virginia Star. So it was founded in about 1877 and uh, they championed uh, educational opportunities. Uh, they didn't acquiesce in the face of adversity or unfairness. Uh, those fellows were pretty um, straightforward about how they felt. There was a time after the, for just one example, there was a time after the formation of the statewide school system in 1870, where in a certain part of Richmond, you had at least 2,000 kids that did not have a school to attend. Well, these guys, uh, the founder and others did not just sit idly by. They would uh, make their way down to City Hall and make the case for opening additional schools. And so again, you know, they were uh, very, you can see activism and they were activists. And uh, probably the Richmond Planet hardly needs any introduction. It was um, uh, John Mitchell, who was the proprietor that most people know about. Uh, but actually in late 1882, you had 12 or 13 formerly enslaved black men found the Richmond planet. And the founding editor, everyone, was Edwin Archer Randolph. It wasn't John Mitchell, but I love to talk about Edwin Archer Randolph because it, it speaks to um, the quest for education prior to the Civil War and after that. Edwin Archer Randolph made his way up to Yale University and uh, finished the literary portion, but he also graduated. Our Edwin Archer Randolph graduated from Yale University in 1880, becoming the first known black graduate of Yale University, uh, uh, period. And by, by, uh, if that weren't enough, he would come back and become the founding editor of the Richmond Planet and also sit on city council. Richmond was also home to the first known black person to graduate from Harvard University's law school, George Lewis Ruffin, the son of George Washington Ruffin, who was from Petersburg. And so these are the stories we don't normally hear. That's why I love to present on that free black experience because you know, our educational opportunities did not start uh, at the end of the civil war the Ruffins actually sent their kids north to, to attain a secondary education. 
in the 1850s and they really made the kids made good on that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I think one of the things that you both have touched on on this is um, a little bit about how these organizations um, kind of have helped in some ways uh, both free black people as well as enslaved people navigate some of these systems of, of racism um, but what we also know is that racism actively strips black people of their ability to provide for their family and selves. Um, and that can have an impact on, um, you know, you know, I always say this is that even welfare systems that exist now, uh, they take away a lot of dignity from people uh, when you have to ask for help. Um, so how did these organizations restore that dignity um, and affirm black people rather than stigmatize them? I think it happened because the black organizations were directly catering to their communities and they were actually helping buttress things that free blacks and enslaved black folks were doing already, right? So if we compare and contrast the white led organizations and the black led organizations, we see with the black led organizations, they are reifying and supporting unions, partnerships and marriages because despite the in legal inability for some black people to get married, to not get married, depending on the geography, we were still doing it, right? Despite the fact that there were laws on the books saying that we could not get an education, these black organizations knew education was incredibly important to us. So they were creating uh, uh, organizations that were founding libraries, that were pulling money together to create bookstores, a la David Ruggles in 1834. They were uh, creating schools. Um, if we contrast that with the white led organizations, they were just pulling money together to deport us. And then if you look at something like the Neshoba community that was established in Tennessee, you actually had to work do involuntary work or servitude, i.e. slavery, in order to pay off your deportation expenses. So I think just comparing and contrasting the services provided by the organizations, you can see who's actually restoring dignity and humanity to, uh, to the community. Um, and I would like to add to that one of the things that I often think about is people cemetery um, is largely due and and it's created, it was bought by the land, several different benevolent mutual aid societies. Um, I think it's very important when we think about uh, the services that mutual aid societies provide, uh, such as funeral arrangements. Um, that in itself is an act of giving dignity back to people who oftentimes were buried in potter's fields. Um, the We all take uh, funerals very seriously. Um, as an archaeologist and an anthropologist, uh, one of the things that we always say is that funerals are not for the dead. <laughs> they are for the living. Um, and so when you think of these um, free black or uh, free black people in particular or um, emancipated people who are still having largely no place to bury their own people, uh, how powerful it is to have something like uh, people's cemetery. Um, where multiple mutual aid societies uh, uh, contributed to that. In fact, our other speaker who's going to be here tonight, Ben Anderson, uh, who worked at Ma who works at Maggie Walker, um, was going to talk about the International Order of St. Luke. Um, if you go to People's Cemetery, you will see that their reach was not just Richmond, but they. if you look at those headstones there at the cemetery, you can see uh, the names of that uh, the International Order of St. Luke, but several other benevolent and mutual aid societies on those headstones. Um, so it's something that is memorialized there is that that uh, impact of mutual aid societies. Um, and I think that's where I find the most giving back of dignity is allowing people to have a respectful burial. May I add to that? Yes, yes, please. Um, I failed to mention two very early uh, burying ground societies, one in Richmond and one in Petersburg. And this will take us back about almost 200 and some odd years. Uh, in Petersburg, we had the Beneficial Society of the Free Men of Color. Uh, what they did is they established their own uh, burial ground so that they could be buried with dignity. Uh, at the same time in Richmond, uh, the 
Burying Ground Society of the Free People of Color of the City of Richmond, that's a mouthful, was formed in around 1815 for that same purpose. And I've been uh, blessed to be privy to one of their um, actual uh, account books that dates back to the 1840s. And in that account book, you can clearly see that these men and women utilized a parliamentary procedure. It, it's, it's incredible. Again, it was founded in 1815. So you had these two parallel organ, uh, uh, organizations in Petersburg and Richmond that um, you know, made it a, a, an important feature in terms of being buried properly. And a lot of these things do go back to Africa in terms of proper burials and that thing. Those things meant a lot. But to see that parliamentary procedure, even before Robert's Rules of Order, was is very interesting in and of itself. Thank you. Um, for the next question, I think it's good for us to start to delve into uh, some of the collective economics that is inherent to mutual aid and beneficial societies. Um, so what you had just kind of ended off with is that uh, or, uh, collective econo or cooperative economics or solidarity economics is something that is uh, not new to Black people as they came to the Americas. It's something that was practiced in Africa. Um, and so we can see that connection. Um, it's also something that we see also on plantations. So this also isn't an idea new to um, newly emancipated people being able to participate in this kind of collective solidarity as well. Um, this would have existed on plantations as the pulling together of money for people to purchase the freedom of uh, certain enslaved individuals. It could also be something as simple as people uh, kind of uh, putting together their individual garden plots and what they get from those uh, to supplement their food. So the idea of communalism is actually, um, I would say, inherent to a system like a plantation, uh, where a lot of times people think it breaks down connections and relationships. I think it actually builds stronger relationships among those who are enslaved. Um, so how do we know of these organizations to participate in uh, cooperative economics or uh, solidarity, solidarity economics or whatever you want to call it, communalism um, here in Petersburg? Well, actually, I think we pretty much clarify that in that, you know, you first see it within the black church and it, you know, emanated from there. So again, you know, with widows or, or little pensions, um, dis, uh, what we would call disability or sick benefits today, people took care of their own within the confines of those churches and uh, also outside of those churches. But those, again, the black church was the center of the black universe. And they, you know, in, endeavor to take care of their own. Okay. okay. All right. I will move on to the next question. So in addition to that, I also kind of just uh, followed with, or I kind of gave you some of this information when I was on the last question, but also thinking of slavery as a system that destroys these personal relationships and what we also call social capital. Um, how do these societies actually encourage and develop a sense of community among uh, Black people across different statuses? So those who are free, uh, those who are newly emancipated, newly migrated, um, and also those who may be without any existing networks um, within the city. So I actually think the U.S. does a fantastic job of this because uh, benevolent societies and mutual aid societies are not unique to the United States, right? So they were actually incredibly popular among uh, African folks and enslaved Africans in the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal and, and Spain. And we would also see them start popping up in Brazil as well. And when you look at the ones specifically in Brazil, you see that uh, fully black, uh, folks had their own societies, enslaved people had their own societies, mixed people or, or, or uh, I suppose biracial people had their own societies. And depending on how much money uh, the members had, that depended on the kind of services that you got and they didn't really intermingle. We don't actually really see that in the US. So we see enslaved and free people coming together in, in the same societies. 
we see them sharing fairly equally the 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 I don't want to say spoils, but the benefits of the societies as well. And so I think that probably helps to build community. And so if folks read uh, the Callie House book by Mary Frances Berry, we know Callie House uh, created her organization, I want to say in 1889 so, or 1880s. But one of the things that Mary Frances Berry says is, Callie House actually for a limited amount of time ended up going to a school founded by a mutual aid society. And so Mary Frances Berry can't quite know what Callie House was thinking when she decided to pull this organization together, but she did mention she feels like um, potentially in this school it was where Callie House learned the importance of taking care of the community and eschewing individualism for collectivism. So I think that's another important way. May I add to that? Yes. Um, we do see in a, at least a couple of unique places, a strata, strata, if you will, tripart, Charleston and New Orleans, because you had black, you had people listed as mulatto, and then you had um, people who were free. So you see these things almost as three separate Cast, if you will. I don't want to say racist, but I mean, it was a, a line of demarcation at one point, but we see it mainly in um, Charleston and New Orleans as examples. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add something? Go ahead. Yeah, I think so. This, since she said South Carolina, Louisiana, this had me thinking about um, James Fortin in Philadelphia. So he was part of the Free African Society and he was good friends with a man named Captain Paul Cuffey who came out of Massachusetts. So Captain Paul Cuffey was, um, it's disputed, but some kind of call him the father of the Back to Africa movement because P Captain Paul Cuffey was a, a, a shipper and he would actually physically use some of his ships to bring Amer black Americans over to Liberia without all the strings uh, required from the Neshoba community or the ACS. And so James Fortin was okay with the idea of certain black people immigrating, but because James Fortin was a shipper himself and part of the elite Philadelphia community, he did not feel that that was for uh, people of his ilk. So your Richard Allen, your, your um, Absalom Jones, your himself, or even Paul Cuffey. So I guess that could be like a separation between what um, newly freed or disenfranchised black folks in Philadelphia or elsewhere should be doing versus what the elite black folks would be doing. All right, all right. Um, so I'm gonna move into uh, our last couple of questions. Um, and so what are the or what were the challenges faced by mutual aid societies to adjust to the changing needs of the black community? Okay, I'll start with that one. At this point, I'm thinking post-1865. Uh, it became quite evident that you could not charge the same, you know, few cents or pennies to um, actually insure someone who's 78 for the same amount you would insure someone for that's 24, okay? Because, you know, you're going to run into some natural human issues with, you know, mortality rates. And so what we start to see is that people became a lot more businesslike about what they charged and who they would take on. Uh, what we do see post-Civil War is the rise of black funerary businesses. You have J.M. Wilkerson here that dates back to 1873, making it probably the second oldest continuously run funeral or funerary business black owned in the country. There was one that was in 1862 that started in Richmond, but in Richmond, I can tell you between 1865 and probably 1880, we had five or six black owned funeral homes. But keep in mind, again, you're going to have to start looking at mortuary records and becoming a little more business like. And we do see that post Civil War. As we move towards the 18 the late 1890s, we had something established called the Hampton, um, there were Hampton meetings, if you will, that 
Ham, I'm sorry, they were called the Hampton Negro Conferences. They would convene some of the brightest minds in the country to look at uh, perhaps bettering homes, businesses, health, and so forth. So out of that Hampton Negro Conference came a federation of black insurance entities, and they started to utilize Negro mortality rates. Okay, so that, you know, again, you can't sustain yourself, you know, charging a person at 78 the same amount of money for the same amount for insurance as someone is 25. So establishing those things like that and establishing a federal organization was pretty big time. Now, what was born out of that Hampton Negro Conference, everyone, again, was uh, the Negro Organization Society which was founded by um, Robert Russo Morton in 1912. The motto was better homes, better health, better farms, and better schools. And so it served as an umbrella institution for the state of Virginia. But there you had the likes of George Washington Carver coming up from Tuskegee to, to um, Hampton to talk about you know, how farmers could perhaps increase their yields. You had the brightest minds in business. Of course, with Booker T. Washington, uh, he founded the uh, National Negro Business League in 1900, where a co-founder and his first vice president was none other than Richmond's own Giles B. Jackson, a black attorney. And so you start to see, um, I should say, uh, advancements, if you will, in how business was conducted and how people looked at health. And out of those uh, benevolent organizations came those leading black insurance companies like Southern Aid, which was founded in 1893 in Richmond. And uh, we talked about the Independent Order of St. Luke. It started out for women only in 1867, but it started to include men in the 1880s. Uh, it grew to have tens of thousands of members in over 20 states. And then came the mighty true reformers, the United Order of True Reformers. They would have upwards of maybe 100,000 members. And of course, there was a Petersburg installment in that particular organization. But we can lay claim in Richmond to the first bank chartered by blacks in all of America. And that was the True Reformers Bank, founded in 1888, opened in 1889 on April the 3rd. Does anyone know what the symbolism is for April the 3rd? The fall of Richmond. So that did not, that, that wasn't lost on them. And so you start to see changes like that as we move into the 1900s. So what happened between 1900, let's say in 1930, you know, uh, the, these chartering uh, bodies uh, uh, associated with the state became more stringent in terms of how you conducted your businesses and so on and so forth. But the biggest thing that's worth mentioning is this, uh, you do see this political um, collectivism. You know, we we haven't we didn't have a chance to talk about the Knights of Labor and those things that came forth and the Colored Farmers Alliance, but these things were integral in how people voted and bodies and that type of thing. But do keep in mind, we do see um, a drop in those business black businesses, or I should say specifically the banks. Because in 1902, with that um, constitutional con uh, second constitutional convention, 90% of black men were disenfranchised. So when you lose the power of the vote, you lose a lot of that collectivism and leadership. Believe it or not, everyone between 1871, when that Jackson Ward was started in Richmond, the ward that was meant to uh, it was a gerrymandered ward meant to corral as many blacks and Republicans as possible into this one huge district. When that was formed, you had between, between 1871 and 1898, we had 33 black men serve on city council. That's astounding. It, the last one finished his, his tenure in 1898. You wouldn't have another black man serve on, uh, be elected to city council until 1948, 50 years later. And that was in large part due to that, the, the effects of that second, the uh, constitutional convention of 1902. Okay. And that, that person in 1948 was the brilliant um, civil rights lawyer, Oliver Hill. So I'm sorry, I'll yield back my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, did you want to add something, Courtney? Yeah, I would actually argue it kind of depends on the organization and the external factors around it. So one of the longest uh, running, uh, one of the longer running organizations would be the New York African uh, Society for Mutual Relief in New York City, founded in 1808 and would not taper out until maybe the 1940s. And so the thing about these societies are the community must absolutely put in some kind of work, right? So you have to put in some money or you have to volunteer your time and labor. And so one thing that we see throughout the 200 odd years of black folks being in these organizations, they're not in one. They're often in two, three, or four because some of the organizations are tailored towards specific things. And so obviously one can't put the same amount of money nor effort into all four at the same time. So one of the things with the New York um, African uh, uh, Mutual Relief Association in New York City, the one thing that would happen is in 1940s, black folks were able to join white organizations or they simply lost interest. Another one would be Fannie Lou Hamer's Freedom Farm um, Cooperative, which she founded in 1969. And so with money, she was able to buy with donations because she was dogmatically against uh, government subsidies. She was able to purchase around 680, 680 acres of land where she allowed at least 200 families to live upon the land. And you had substantial acreage where one could farm. And then she also had the pig bank so families could actually get a pig for meat. And so despite the fact that the monthly due was only $1, less than 50 families were actually paying their monthly dues. And a large portion of people were not, they were taking food, they were taking pigs, they were taking a lot of the assistance provided by the Freedom Prom Cooperative, but they weren't actually tilling the land. So even if they didn't have the money, they weren't actually coming on and actually farming. And so I think that's another reason. Um, if I think about Kelly House's organization, she was essentially taken down by uh, corrupt folks in the government. And so Kelly House, in order to get dues, in order to promote the organization, she was actually using the U.S. Postal Service. So the postal office, uh, um, the pensions office, as well as the Department of Justice, after one year of her organization operating, decided to investigate her under the Comstock law of, I think, maybe 1878, one of the, in the 1870s, saying that they were using the mail to perpetuate fraud. And so for years, Kelly House and her organization attempted to show the government that they weren't doing anything wrong, they weren't over-promising former enslaved people anything, they had one of their conventions in Washington, D.C., and actually invited government officials to attend the meeting, which I don't believe they did. Ultimately, in she sued, she got one of the best black attorneys in the United States to try the case, ended up losing, unfortunately. Callie House would be jailed. Um, her second in command would also be jailed. Uh, so because she could not get dues via mail and she could not promote the organization via mail, the organization languished with many of the members actually going to Marcus Garvey's organization, but they would do the same thing to him years later. So there are multiple reasons, and I think you often have to look at the external factors um, why these organizations faltered. So that's my piece. Thank you. Um, and lastly, before going to our audience questions, um, Considering there's still a lack of research directed towards benevolent mutual aid societies, uh, why do you think these organizations are still relevant today? Well, I think they're relevant. And this, there's been a, a, a extensive amount actually done, but a lot of these, um, a lot of these journals are, are, are somewhat difficult to um, access, but through digitization, we can actually access a lot more than we used to. Um, but what was that the question again? How? Oh, yes. To me, examining those um, institutions and uh, the like, mutual aid societies serve as a blueprint for today. You know what worked that powerful sense of collectivism 
And, um, you know, if one does well, we all do well. We're all in it together. Uh, so to me, the collectivism and uh, the factor and uh, the, the importance of faith in the midst of that, people don't talk enough about it. But these things are really inherently faith based and they had to evolve. But, you know, still you have mutual aid societies still within churches and organizations. You have an organization here in Petersburg. Mm -hmm. And so these things, you know, history is only as good at what it te what we can glean from it. And we're seeing uh, beautiful things like that occur today. But the blueprint was uh, made for, you know, centuries ago. I think she said it perfectly. I would have okay. said it. Okay. Same thing, less eloquently. <laughs> no, and I think that sounds good. Um, one of the books that we weren't able to get here tonight was a book by uh, Jessica Nimhard Gordon uh, called uh, Cooperative or Collective Courage. And one of the things I think that's really important when you read this book or what you will take away from it um, is just the amount of mutual aid societies, beneficial societies. Um, she focuses in this book as well on co-ops as, uh, as another form, but just the absolute amount that was generated. And not every one of these organizations had a long run necessarily, um, but they were instrumental in their communities, um, specifically in those purposes of integration and building community um, for people, um, as I had kind of alluded to earlier, how important they were also in building positive um, ideas about black identity, uh, specifically for those who were previously enslaved, um, for those who were free black and still living under systems that were uh, quite oppressive. Um, and then I also think that they also were important in gathering people when there are many laws out there during the time of their, <laughs> their um, beginning that said that black people could not gather. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so they provided opportunities for all of that to happen. Um, so just learning about the absolute amount of them is really, um, powerful. And one of the things I went to a lecture at the Virginia, um, uh, fine arts museum, um, about the, uh, black imaginary and the panelists there, um, at the end, the last question was, uh, how can we learn more about these or where's a place that we can go to reflect of this? And I, I really do say, please go to People's Cemetery and take a moment to look at those headstones. Um, that really does give you that kind of visual, immediate kind of visual impact of how many of these societies existed um, and pulled together their money, um, not just for the burial, but um, some of those mutual aid societies that operated at People's Cemetery also took part in um, kind of specializing around what their operation was for that funeral. Um, so it made it so that we get all of the money from the actual burial. Another person gets all of the money for the creation of the caskets. Another person would get the money for um, the actual, you know, kind of, um, uh, you know, taking care of the body. And so they were able to specialize these things so that everyone had their piece of the pie and getting the money from this operation, which I think is really important rather than one mutual aid society actually saying, I wanna do all of it. <laughs> um, and so uh, just the idea that you're able to break that mutual aid up in, in multiple pieces, um, I think is important as well. So um, with that, I would like to move to some of the audience questions. Okay, do we have anybody here with any questions? Yes. Would you consider organizations like the NAACP, um, the Mutual Aid Society, uh, and, and a continuation of that legacy? Yes. Um, so the question is, would you consider uh, organizations like the NAACP a beneficial society or mutual aid society? I don't know if I would consider it as it exists today as a mutual aid society. It definitely, its origins came from the mutual aid societies, though. It came from kind of the colored conventions movement where we're moving past um, eliminating a food desert within a very small community or getting one school built in a small town towards uh, creating policy that will affect several towns to a state and then going to the national level. Because in the colored convention, what you would see, it, you would see them... Um, 
discussing the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which had some of our black leaders like William Wells Brown stuck in England because once he became a famous writer, his enslaver saw some of his literature and was like, I would like my property back, please. And he couldn't come back for fear that he would actually be returned to slavery legally. And so uh, it was, I think it was an English abolition society who actually put forth the money. And after they paid off as enslaver, he was able to freely come back home. Um, I can't remember what where he's going with that. But yeah, so the, the, the um, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, at this point you see them um, questioning whether the best thing for African-Americans to do is actually to immigrate and where to immigrate. Should it be Haiti? Should it be up to Canada? Should it be Liberia and Sierra Leone, which at this point were founded? You see them discussing whether they, as black men, should volunteer themselves to fight in wars whether it's um, the Mexican-American War or even the Civil War and how much one should participate in the war and whether by participating you would get your full civic rights considering they had fought in the War of 1812, they had fought in the American Revolution under this premise that perhaps if they see how loyal we are to the nation, they will just give us those full rights. And we know, of course, that wasn't exactly the case. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I would say the structure of the current NAACP today is a mutual aid society, but I very much so see it as a legacy of the mutual aid and benevolent societies that were founded in the past. Okay, all right. Okay, I do not know the direct address. <laughs> it is on Crater Road. I do not know that. Right across from Blandford Cemetery. I was like, is this a person who's local or not local? <laughs> but yes, it is uh, located on Crater Road across from Blandford Cemetery. Three thirty four South Crater Road. Do not go there tonight, though. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> good, good. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Yes, so was the money given to mutual aid society, or was the money collected from mutual aid societies only from dues? So it kind of depends on the mutual aid society or the organization. We do know that some of the earlier organizations, um, like the uh, some of the ones in Boston and Philadelphia and even Newport, uh, Rhode Island, they were actually sending money to each other. If I remember correctly, it would be a mutual aid society in Massachusetts that would send the Free African Society in Philadelphia some money that would actually help get their church constructed. Um, and so you also had, uh, I guess, white charitable groups and benefactors who would also donate money. So it wasn't, depending on the organization, some could have come from other places. Well, if there are no more questions. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm not exactly sure because I got here late if you covered it or not. Um, a lot of you know, mutual aid is obviously covered with the actual community and being face to face with own people. But with like the internet, like a lot of things have shifted. So would you consider uh, mutual aid being those where you uh, give people like GoFundMe? Mm. Yeah, uh, that's something I thought about a few days ago. That is our version of it. It really is. You know, we see it for funerals. We see it for people who have been burned out of their homes. It is the 21st century's mutual aid society. It really is. In addition to funding documentaries and the like. <laughs> Absolutely.
Okay. <laughs> okay, mutual aid professional. All right, our fourth panelist. We have been talking about collectivism. Yay. Yes, is that the right answer? I think that's a wonderful answer. And I wonder if it is the transition for Vinay to come to the stage. Yes, so we also have Vinay Kirkland with us tonight. Uh, she runs the uh, Petersburg Mutual Aid Society. Um, and yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi. A pleasure to meet you all. Um, I definitely I appreciate every single thing about this uh, presentation because um, not only did I learn a lot, but it's like I I wrote so many notes. And um, let me tell you about Petersburg Mutual Aid. It, I guess, is a continuation of an extremely long legacy, as I did know, right? But I didn't know that it started at the beginning of America, right? Um, I did know that it was rooted in African tradition, though. And I do know that it's something that none of us can live without, right? Nobody can live without some kind of aid from our neighbors, and our neighbors aren't just people who live beside us. Our neighbor is everybody on this globe, right? And um, Petersburg Mutual Aid only has been in existence, you know, with me in it at least, for a year, right? We had our first birthday in um, August. And um, we just, we are facing the challenges that uh, were put forth. First of all, I love the challenges portion of this um, of the uh, presentation. Um, I mean, of course, it was a little sad, but I could listen to y'all talk about the, the pitfalls and the downfalls of our mutual aid organizations because this is what we really need to know. How did we fall apart, even despite the fact that we need each other to survive, right? And basically, what I heard was the, biz the business vacation of mutual aid societies. The fact that our communities must put in some kind of work for mutual aid to be successful, whether it's money or labor, and the fact that both, you know, capitalism and sometimes even the government don't like it when you're kind of taking what they might consider to be their turf, right? Because if you got your help from each other, you wouldn't need them, right, as much. Um, so we are trying to find out what Petersburg Mutual Aid is trying to find out what the community wants, right? That's our biggest focus because so many people have become atomized, right? Individualized, um, afraid of human bonding and connection, right? Everywhere you see outside is hate. And some people have lost the capacity or even, you know, the hope to be loved, right? And so Petersburg Mutual Aid is seeking to find out what people really need, what do they need at their core, which is belonging, but how does that manifest in action, right? Um, I don't want to ramble, but there are if there is information on the desk behind everybody, if you wanna know more about um, Petersburg Mutual Aid specifically, um, this kind of version, of course, obviously we had many, many other um, examples that I will definitely be digging in more and finding out more um, and hopefully embodying them today. And um, some of the things that we are working on, we have a couple of campaigns. Um, I guess I shouldn't go too deeply into them. I don't know how much time we have, but we have the you know Virginia Reliability Project. Has anybody ever heard of that? So that is a pipeline um, expansion project um, 
funded by TC Energy and Columbia Gas, which is probably the company everybody here used to heat their homes, right? And I hope y'all have been nice and warm over the winter, but uh, <laughs> TC Energy is trying to expand, you know, the horsepower and the pollution that will come with it um, in order purely for funds, not because we have any real reliability issue in terms of our heating, you know. Um, we also have the casino coming up, if anybody knows about that. And that's a simple referendum vote, right? So hopefully, you know, if you want to know more about that, um, read the news and come to Petersburg Mutual Aid because we'll be um, organizing around that. And last, uh, we like to put on events. I, I, I consider that to be community building uh, opportunities. Uh, we just did a, a poetry night where we also talked about the um, BRP Virginia Reliability um, Project. And uh, we're also open to any other type of outreach, any type of collaboration, anything anybody want to do. So information in the back. Oh, um, social media. Uh, I tend to uh, do the Instagram stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I am, believe it or not, you know, in my 30s, I'm not particularly technologically savvy. So uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Y'all notice I never did the little, oh, Lord, I'm about to make myself sound silly. silly. Um, you know how on Instagram that you have the circle around your <laughs> story? The story? <laughs> See, I don't even know how to do that. So I need to do that one day so I could be down with the people. Um, I'm done. <laughs> oh, my handle? At Petersburg Mutual Aid on everything, if we have it. We don't have a Twitter. Um, we have a uh, Facebook that nobody uses. Uh, <laughs> Instagram is basically what I use. Um, Petersburg Mutual Aid at protonmail.com is our um, email, and I check that daily. Um, so, anything else? All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I'll take your mic. So. Um, with that being said, I just want to highlight a couple of other things. Uh, we do have an artist in the back, uh, Andre Ein. Uh, he has a couple of pieces for you all to view, um, as well as a couple for sale tonight. Um, there are still refreshments, so please help yourself to that. Um, and as I had said before, the bookstore will be open for another hour if you want to peruse and look through uh, for anything Elva is also available here to sign if you brought your own co uh, copy of uh, the American series Richmond um, or if you'd like to purchase one here tonight. Um, and I just want to follow what Vinay said. Uh, we didn't touch on this necessarily um, within the uh, question about challenges. Um, but when we had our call, we kind of touched on this, is the idea as well that we all, I think some mutual aid and benevolent societies um, fall to the idea that we all start to get busy. We all start to get overwhelmed with our personal and we all lose that connection to somebody else. Um, and I think uh, the work that Vinay is talking about, that's not just a, uh, a project to rally around, but also just the idea of community building and uh, getting to know your neighbor is essential to um, uh, these mutual aid and benevolent societies. So um, just wanted to point that out as I think one of the major challenges is that a lot of times we turn away from each other rather than turning towards each other. Um, and I'm not going to leave on that note. So uh, I just want to <laughs> say thank you to Demetrius um, for allowing us to host this event here. Um, if you haven't signed in, uh, please sign in if you're already not on the listserv for the Historic Petersburg Foundation. Uh, we can email you about more events that we'll have coming up. Um, and thank you for coming. We appreciate it greatly. <laughs> the one clap before. <laughs>